I'd just like you to confirm again that you're sure about the information you gave me, James said into his phone, while hurrying to his destination, the metal floor clanking underneath his feet with each step. His gaze was focused downwards onto a list he had hastily copied from his phone in quick scribbles before making this call. It was a number of different concessions and deals that the powers of Earth and the human territories had decided he would be officially allowed to offer to the Miak government in their name, after their experts and analysis had slaved away to untangle all the information James had given them over the last weeks, and especially the last few days. After all, the stress we put the Tomastrochites through, and especially after cutting the Parasheim of intergalactic trade for so long, I'm just not sure if extending an offer like this is going to be such a wise decision. I mean, how can we claim to be in this together if we're just willing to bend the rules for ourselves? When he had first read over the list of possible deals, it had immediately left a bitter taste in his mouth that one of the concessions he was allowed to make was a trade route between Earth and Dunima. The reason was obvious. Most likely the politicians wanted to capitalise on the way Dunima had been isolated by the community by trying to become the planet's most valuable business partner in its stead. And while he couldn't claim that that was in its essence a bad strategy, he did have to wonder if annulling the Orion Alliance's agreement to keep the borders shut to anything but diplomatic travel for the time being wouldn't gain humanity the ire of their allies, who had so far been asked to sacrifice quite a lot during this conflict. Leave the warriors of our allies to us and themselves, Mr. Aldwin, Savesh Kumar, the body representative of the Triad Kakumina, and also James's current boss, replied in a calm and reassuring tone. They are more than capable of speaking up for themselves, I assure you, and their representatives will not be shy to do so. We are far from doing anything that will push our comrades away from us, I assure you, and their diplomats have been granted quite similar permissions to yours by our alliance. James sighed. Although that all sounded mostly like fancy talk, he probably shouldn't have expected anything else. After all, he was dealing with professionals here, who had likely put a lot more thought into this whole thing than he did. Not that he was an expert on this by any means. He would just keep being the face here for the time being. Although... Speaking of his allies' representatives, now that he was in a close to standard gravity environment again, he wondered if he would possibly get to meet some of them. According to his current information, he was not the only diplomat sent out towards Dunima anymore. What's your status, by the way? Representative Kumar suddenly asked, speaking up again after James had presumably been silent too long for his taste. James bit down on his lower lip while refocusing himself. We arrived on Sankatot Station a while ago, and are en route to our meeting with Kwafwem, he dutifully reported, inadvertently glancing around himself while he spoke about his current location. The Sankatot, the station with the rich and influential of Dunima, who could not be bothered to share a living space with the rest of their species anymore, and had instead decided to build a special place for themselves, orbiting the planets of their star system. Apart from the smooth, very obviously Dunamanian architecture surrounding them, it wasn't anything all too special in James's eyes. Space stations had a tendency to look pretty samey, all things considered. Despite all the local differences, in the end it was just another metal ring floating in space, just with a different coat of paint thrown onto it. James had briefly visited Sankatyot before in a sort of brief publicity visit, though back then his presence here had been tolerated at best, despite everyone remaining polite. Today, however, he had been officially invited. He wasn't sure why Quafwem had decided to call him all the way out here today, instead of just meeting him in one of his buildings down on the planet again, like he had done during their rather fruitless meetings. If he had to guess, it was probably just because this was somehow more convenient for the feline schedule in the end. Of course, it was strange altogether that Dunima's most important man had suddenly shown interest in a meeting of his own volition, but during his stay on the planet, James had learned to not get too excited for anything that vaguely promised results. In that case, best of luck, Mr. Aldwin, the representative said in an almost cheering manner. Don't let Mamon get the best of you. Goodbye. Bye. James could just about get out before the representative had hung up on him. He put his phone away with a stressed exhale, and although the representative had acted reassuringly towards him, James could feel that he too had his work more than cut out for him in the background. Every now and then, James had to remind himself that, all things considered, he had quite the easy job here. Sure, technically also one of the more dangerous ones, but ultimately still easy. He just had to forge first connections and other people would iron them out for him. 
Then again, this whole ordeal wasn't exactly a task that one man was fit to fulfill. It's quite full here today, she just suddenly commented from his side, ripping him out of his thoughts. So far, she had just quietly walked along with him, while the both of them were surrounded by their security detail on all sides. Apparently, while James had been busy thinking about the task at hand, his girlfriend had instead felt inclined to pay more attention to their surroundings. Following her example, James looked around, and while he would have loved to claim that he was by now used to Miat's sensibilities in all facets of life, he had to admit that the place didn't exactly look all that full to him. Of course, he had to remind himself that Miat would most of the time prefer to have the maximum possible distance between each other, and therefore tended to not live densely, but this was a space station, and therefore only offered so much room. Had it been a lot emptier last time they had been here? He couldn't tell. However, one thing even he noticed was that a good number of the Miat loitering all around them in small groups and throwing disagreeable glasses at the group of humans passing by didn't exactly appear to be dressed for the occasion. One thing he remembered about his last visit here quite vividly was how much he and even Shida had stood out among all the people of the station who appeared to be at all times dressed in the Dunama fancy attire of decorating themselves with a large variety of metal clothing or accessories going far above and beyond the simple chainmail that his girlfriend tended to wear. Yet many of the felines surrounding them now seemed to dress more moderately in skin and leather, and only the occasional metal sheen being visible. Some were even dressed in full fabric, indicating some form of workers' clothes around here. And somehow, James doubted that all of them were custodians. For a second, he wondered if he should tip everyone off to his observations, however he immediately doubted that it was necessary. Out of his former team, he was far from the most observant of them all. And while he didn't like this at all, he didn't want to call off such a possibly important meeting based on a gut feeling alone. Let's leave the locals to deal with that, he instead stated, trying to reassure Shida that this was hopefully nothing for them to worry about, although he did take care to keep it in the back of his mind. Surely a station for the richest of the rich would have proper security, right? We have somewhere to be. From then, it didn't take long for them to arrive at their destination, which was a large building that was surprisingly not at all that distinguishable from the one surrounding it. Somehow, James had expected Kwa Fuem to have more of a flair for the dramatic when it came to choosing his personal buildings and the place for the rich amongst the rich. Then again, since this was a station, maybe he didn't actually have that choice. Or maybe he just wasn't giving the man enough credit in the end. Without much fanfare, they were invited in, and the surrounding Mia security personnel didn't so much as look at them twice, while they were guided inside by the now quite familiar face of Lloyd Javar, who seemed to be rather stripped for words today, as he completely avoided making any small talk. He simply guided them through what on the inside appeared to be a small office building, likely only housing the workplaces of the highest positions in the Komato Peno, an assumption that James based purely on the location and the air of self-importance that the Miet manning the different workspaces exuded as he walked past them. The office of the big man himself awaited at the end of their little tour, and James and company were ushered inside without much fanfare, although half of their security opted to remain outside, both to keep watch on everything surrounding the office, and to not overcrowd the medium-sized room. Stepping inside and seeing the typical office furniture and decoration all around, James wondered for a second just how many offices Carfoam might have had all across Dunima, while he sank down into a chair opposite of the White Lion. James wasn't sure if it was because they were meeting in a less casual setting this time, or if there was more to it. However, something seemed to be different about Kwa from today. Not that his actual expression was visibly different. The way his blue eyes stared out of his pale face with predatory amusement appeared to be just the same as always. However, there was a different air about the man that was hard to explain. It was just a feeling of him being less relaxed somehow, although James couldn't pin down the tell that led him to that conclusion. Welcome, Ambassador, Quaffon greeted him, and his white hair and pale skin made him appear a lot older than he actually was, while his golden armour reminded of overzealous depictions of saints in old pictures. It seems you have been busy recently. The feline massaged the back of his left hand for a second, and with the way he was fidgeting with it, it seemed like he was deciding if he should do something with it or not, although he ultimately decided against it, and put both of his hands down flatly onto the table. 
James, of course, was long past playing nice at this point. It's never been a secret that I came to Dunima to work, he said decidedly, and folded his gloved hands, touching the tips of his index fingers together. This isn't a vacation for me, but a diplomatic visit. So yes, I have been keeping myself busy. After having learned more about Dunima's richest man, and the connections he most likely held keeping him in that position, James wasn't going to allow Quafram to waste any of his time. On Dunima, business was king. This tone had worked with Zisha D. It would hopefully work with Quafram as well. And indeed, there seemed to be a twinkle in the feline's blue eyes as he stared back at them, his pale turning forwards and moving his white mane of hair in the process. He then let out a hissing breath through his teeth, the stream of air being cut apart by his sharp fangs as he amusedly lifted his cheeks. Has it been that long since we last met? He asked under his breath, with a hint of a snicker in his voice, before shaking his head and looking straight into James's eyes, despite the visor in between. Certainly you're a busy man, and you've been quite perseverant during your time here, I must say. James sighed. Next to him, he could hear Sheeta mumble something that he didn't understand. He didn't know if it was just too quiet for him to hear, or if she had actually switched to a language he didn't comprehend. Whichever it was, it didn't seem to be an obstacle for Kwa Fuem, since the man chuckled even stronger in response to her words, even though she hadn't exactly sounded like she was making a joke. Although James was quite certain of Sheeta's competence, he still sincerely hoped that she hadn't let anything slip, that he'd rather not be out there. In an attempt to indicate to her that they should better remain on the same page, he reached his right hand over to squeeze hers. Right, right, then let's talk business, shall we? The pale Mia then continued, having seemingly been scorned by Shida in one way or another, although he didn't appear all too broken up about it. As a reaction, James leaned back in his chair. Go on, he simply said, having tried to talk business with the man for a while now, with all of his attempts being shut down. And now, he didn't know if he was all that interested in hearing out the man anymore, especially since it was no secret that Qua Frem was in a bit of an uncomfortable situation. Not that his other choice was much more appealing ultimately, but at least they didn't seemingly work together with the very people, or at least comrades of the very people that had kidnapped James and cost him his arm in the past. The white lion across the table wove his fingers together, claws extending out of their tips as they gently fiddled either with each other or the table's plate, depending on what they reached first. As the leading figure in my section of the market, he explained, while once again staring straight into the area he knew James's eye to be, even while they were obscured. I like to stay on top of the newest developments pertaining to it. I consider it vital to my business, you see. Almost as vital as your dealings with outside forces, I'm sure, James scornfully thought to himself, but then also had to realise that he himself technically represented such an outside force right now. And as much as he hated to admit it, in a galactically connected age, outside dealings were most likely vital to every leader of every market. And while he assumed that the dealings involved usually were a lot less shady, it would still be in his best interest if humans were seen as influential enough to be worth considering for deals by a man with such influence, even if James Percy would have much rather seen Qua Fuem kicked to the curb. But at least the mention of new developments gave James a hint as to why he had suddenly gotten this invitation. It seemed that Qua Fuem might have been getting cold feet, after learning a bit more about the people he had so outright rejected so far. Let me guess, James commented confidently, and deciding that playing with his food was just the kind of karmic retribution that the white line deserved. You've stumbled upon our means of production, have you? Quarfren released a heavy breath through his nose. I must admit, I was surprised when I read the reports of the kind of things you do on Earth, he explained, and it seemed he was trying quite hard to keep a neutral face. Usually no means of producing food, no matter how undeserving of existence, surprises me. However, this time, I admittedly had to wonder if what I was looking at was real. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that it is... unnatural. James scoffed. It is perfectly natural. In fact, there is no such thing as unnatural. All we have ever done is use the tools that nature has provided for us. We just tend to get a bit more creative with them. James immediately shot back, having heard that specific critique of his kind of work too many times, even before coming into contact with the more purest elements of the galactic community. However, as soon as he realised that he had fallen into his old habit of simply justifying and explaining his work, 
He also realised that ethical concerns clearly weren't what an unscrupulous businessman like Qua Fuem would be ultimately concerned about, even if they went against his own beliefs. Therefore, James also added, Yes, it's perfectly natural, but more importantly, it's a threat to your business, isn't it? Qua Fuem's eyes narrowed, turning into little more than tiny slits, out of which the blue of his irises gleamed like a blade. If the reports about the production from your planet are to be believed, he began, but James immediately went to cut him off. There is quite literally no reason why they would be false, he stated firmly with a wave of his hand. The only one we are reporting to is ourselves. We don't need to make up numbers for anyone. I can personally assure you that the rate at which we can produce meat via cloning far exceeds anything that can be done with any more traditional methods. He was completely confident in that. No matter how many cages you stacked on top of each other in the most bestial of conditions, and how many drugs and hormones you would pump into your animals, the results wouldn't come even close to the kind of yield you could get out of a cloning facility. And not only that, the meat that you cloned would also have a better quality in every single case. Objectively speaking, it was superior in every measure. Fine, with your production being as it is, Kwa Fuem rephrased his earlier statement in a slightly annoyed tone and a dismissive exhale. I can see why certain factors might show interest in you. Certain factors, huh? Most likely the exact factors that he couldn't keep from at least trying to do trade without his blessing, using his influence alone. James wondered if the man already knew about their talks with Zisha D. It wouldn't have surprised him. Somehow he figured that very little happened on this planet without Kwa Fuem knowing about it. The way that Zisha D's current hiding place had been fortified, from what was presumably a simple server room, to something that resembled a military outpost spoke towards that. That wasn't a precautionary measure. That was a direct defense against something. And now you want an early share of said production for yourself, to further cement your position in the market before the prices drop. Did I get that right? She now spoke up from next to James, and he could feel her hand tighten around his. He had a feeling that this whole conversation didn't exactly make her very happy. However, Quafro's reaction to her summation surprised him. His ears shot up and fluttered backwards, and his eyes went from the small slits they had formed to wide open in just a second, while he began to break out into a Miat's typical wheezing laughter. Goodness, no, he replied, as soon as he had his breathing back under control, which took not more than a second, and he defensively waved both of his hands while leaving his elbows on the table. You're sty be jealous, I have a reputation to upkeep. Can you imagine me trying to sell laboratory runoff to people as food? He obviously made the idea out to be utterly ridiculous, so much so that he even looked over to Lloyd Javar, who stood silently somewhere behind James together with his security. Lloyd Javar didn't quite share his boss's outburst, restraining himself to merely an amused smile on his face, while he too dismissed the idea with a head shake and a mild swaying of his tail. That might be the one thing that could bankrupt even us. The assistant agreed, restrainedly, although the amusement of the idea was still clear in his voice. Maybe even a bit too clear. Qua Frem let out a couple more chuckles that shook the loosely connected plates of metal on his clothing, before completely settling down again. No, he repeated himself after a long exhale, during which he also rotated his large ears forwards again. No, Shida, I do not want anything to do with your mystery meat. Admittedly, the idea of producing tons and tons of food for dirt cheap, while investing no more than regular garbage into the feeding costs, it does sound enticing at first, but only if you don't consider any of the surrounding context. Cloned meat, produced by mutant cells, sustained by pestilent microorganisms, fed with garbage. Who in their right mind would even accept something like that on their plate? James scoffed slightly. Of course you can make anything sound unappealing. In the end, the origin did not change anything about the quality, and the quality was excellent. Still, he looked over at Shida, remembering her own apprehension when she had first learned about what the humans had been feeding to her during her stay with them. However, she had soon realised that she had eaten the clone meat without complaining for weeks, before she had been told what exactly it was, and it had been no problem for her during that time. And right now, her face told James that her spite was far outweighing any second thought she might have still had on the topic. You get used to it, she defiantly assured the man, with a nasty hint of a sneer on her face. Quafem shrugged. For that, you'd have to start using it in the first place, he countered calmly, and I don't see anyone sinking that low anytime soon. 
I'm sure it hasn't escaped you that this technology has so far not found any adopters outside of human space, even with many carnivores being much less prideful in their diet than we Miat are. The very thinly vowed insult that came along with his words did not go past anyone present. Sinking that low, as he clearly perceived anyone in front of him had sunken. You invited us here to talk business, didn't you? James now chimed in again, feeling she'd attend subsequently at the Pell Man's musings. How about you keep your opinions to yourself and speak of something with actual value instead? Surely we haven't come all this way for you to tell us that you're simply not interested in our trade. He turned his head to the side, allowing his neck to release a loud, satisfying crack that made the ears of the felines of the room noticeably flinch. He wasn't going to let Bravado get the better of him here. Quafuem wanted something from him, and he wasn't going to let himself be distracted from that fact. Not again. The pale Miat gave him a distasteful look after he had returned his head into its normal position again. Right, Quafuem said, bringing his hands together with his woven fingers again. I'll say it clear to you. I don't want any of that garbage mugging up my market. People won't buy it anyway, but that doesn't mean it isn't going to mess with some prices. And there are people out there just about crazy enough to try and brute force it. Which means their trade with Earth could be a real headache, and make life a whole lot more difficult for many of my people. And that for a minimal return for any party in the end. The way I see it, if your people start trying to throw around their weight here, everyone's going to lose out in the end. And nobody wants that. He paused for a moment to stretch himself, his claws extending as he shoved his arms forward, while also pushing his shoulders back. I'm not crazy enough to think that I can keep your people from doing trade around here if they want to, he continued, admitting that fact surprisingly candidly for a man in his position. Yet somehow this only made it seem all the more likely he knew exactly about the kind of influence he held, at least not without it turning into a whole other mess. But even if you think you can spread your influence like that, it's going to take time, and time that you may not have. After all, who knows when that next election rolls around? Could be in a year? Could be tomorrow? I personally have no idea. James exchanged a glance with Sheeda. Her yellow eyes burned in their sockets, but her expression was hardened, and showed that she was at least listening. Maybe not, interestedly, but she wasn't outright dismissing anything. And you want what? James asked, turning back to Kwa Fuem, and giving his tone the same amount of ridicule that the white Miet had used earlier when considering the introduction of cloned meat into the market. To pay us for not doing trade? He had a good idea that Kwa Fuem knew that trying to threaten humanity wasn't in his best interest. Even if he had the power and influence to keep them away from his interests, it would take serious resources to do so, and also firmly place what was shaping up to be one of the galaxy's leading powers, one way or another against him. Kaf Wem shook his head. Of course not, he replied with a scoff. That would raise too many questions, and besides, I can't exactly start endorsing you as a candidate without us or our people having any prior history, making that change believable. That is still what you're after, right? James raised an eyebrow. Kaf Wem was pretty quick to make his offer there, it seemed. However, James ignored his question for now, instead prying further into another angle of the conversation, as he asked, And what connection did you have in mind, exactly? It wasn't quite clear if Kwa Fuem saw this as James showing interest in his offer, but it certainly seemed that way, as the Mia's ears perked up ever so slightly together with his cheeks. His eyes also opened a bit wider. I told you I like to stay on top of the newest developments in my market, Kwa Fuem repeated his earlier drivel, before elaborating on the terms he had in mind for their possible deal. However, it is not always necessary to reinvent the wheel. Your people seem to be quite happy with eating the meat that your laboratories are cooking up, don't they? And since it is so effective, Earth still has plenty of real estate for the stuff that everyone else would consider edible. Just ship that over here for a bit of exotic variety, and we can make a deal. Been a while since I could put a nice, big price tag on something. With exclusivity, I presume, James asked with a tilt of his head. Obviously, Quafum replied immediately. James had to stop himself from sighing. What a joke. Did that guy have any idea how much time he could have saved the both of them if he had just come around with an offer like this from the start? Back then, James would barely have had a reason to even question it. So, what had changed now? He thought back to Quafum's earlier question. 
By now it seemed like the feline may have been planning to at least seemingly play with an open hand. Won't your partners mind if you suddenly endorse me against their will? He inquired, semi-expecting Kwa Fuem to immediately snap and shut down anything even slightly resembling an accusation like Avezalon had done back during their meeting with Zisha D. However, the White Lion appeared to be completely unperturbed by James's insinuations. He had a relaxed look on his face, and his eyes closed slightly as if he was tired. My partners and I have been working together since long before you came along, he informed the human unabashedly, and placed his arms on the table with his open palms facing up to the ceiling. Your status has nothing to do with our agreements. Your involvement is more of a, well, more of a side effect. And besides, when all this is ended, being a friend of humanity will pay out for us, one way or the other. That much wasn't untrue. James had entered the political scene just a few months ago, while the isolation of Dunamur under Quarfwem's lead had been going on for years at this point. And no matter how the conflict turned out, both sides intended for humanity to have at least a symbolically leading role, just in very different directions. So at least his superficial logic was sound. Still, he didn't want to let the man off the hook quite so easily. Despite Kwa Fuem's confident demeanour, James felt like he was holding some cards for the first time since he came to this world. He wasn't going to give them up just like that. And people will just accept you suddenly opening trade? A with a species as controversial as the humans at that? He pried further, not giving his opponent much time to gather his thoughts. But Kwa Fuem was a businessman who had to deal with all types in his past. He wasn't shaken quite so easily. Who I do business with is my own decision and nobody else's. Whoever wants to challenge that can try if they wish. He said decidedly, and brought his palms together in a clap. The other, Komata Pano, will have a hard time justifying a total ban on trade with Earth, especially after they have been aching for more trade for so long. Maybe some of them will even be able to peck at the crumbs that will be left behind for them by this exchange. James felt the urge rise up within him to stand up and end the talks right then and there. Aching for trade. They had been aching for trade since he had left them to bleed dry for so long. However, he managed to suppress it successfully, to the point that not even his muscles tensed. As much as he wanted to throw everything he thought of him into Quarfram's face, or maybe even flip the table on the man, it wasn't his place, and doing any of that would be overstepping some serious boundaries on his part. After all, he was here to build bridges, not to burn them. His duty was to at least extend the offer to the people who actually knew their shit in situations like these, or he'd have to hope that they would make the right decisions here. If an outburst on his part would be the reason that cooperation between Earth and Dunamur would become impossible, it would be irreconcilable. And so he had to keep his cool, like he had learned to do over such a long time so many years ago. Keep his cool, stay collected, and do his damn job. With that, your offer is about equal to that of some of our other possible assets in my eyes, James stated, letting go of Sheeta's hand, to bring the tips of his fingers together. I'll accept it as your proposal and will pass it on to my superiors, who will ultimately decide which deal is the most fitting for our interests. I'm sure you will agree that I wouldn't be the right person to discuss exact numbers with. With now two offers, both promising and unattractive at the same time under his belt, James could feel his stay on Dunamur slowly creep towards his end. And not a moment too soon, as the date they had pinned down as the arrival of a certain captain on the close by Nosomaoni station was also starting to come concerningly close, and he really did not want to miss that meeting for Shida's sake. Suddenly, Kwafuem lifted his hand in a stopping motion, before pushing his chair back slightly, clearly with the intention of getting up. Just one more thing, he requested. Waving his hand downwards to indicate for James to remain seated, while he got to his feet and turned towards a small file cabinet behind him. While I'm sure that I can beat out any offer of the people desperate enough to try and sell your cloned meat to people, I do actually have something here to sweeten the deal some more for you personally as well. Curiously, James looked up at the man, but remained seated as requested. Knowing that the more he said, the more wrong things he could say, he just kept his mouth shut and observed for the time being. What could Kwa Fuem have specifically for him? However, next to him, he could suddenly hear a strange sound, and turning his head, he was surprised to find Shida sitting there and... snickering? Her mood had suddenly changed since her earlier hints of anger. In fact, she looked similarly amused to the way Kwa Fuem had expressed himself just earlier. 
You know what your problem is, Quafwem? She then asked into the silence, making everyone except the addressed himself turn towards her. Meanwhile, Quafwem pulled open one of the drawers in the cabinet and purposely reached for a single sheet of paper that had been placed on top of the rows of folders that usually inhabited the cabinet, as if it were only still there temporarily. I'm sure you're going to tell me, the Pelmiev replied, while zealously taking the sheet into his hands and swinging it around with a loud wobble of stiff paper as he turned back towards the desk. Shida scoffed. Yes, she replied, in a simple statement that immediately erased all emotion that had previously filled it from her voice. You've never been hungry before. Quafram lifted his eyebrows at her, as if he was awaiting a punchline. However, Shida didn't elaborate any further. For a second, James wondered about her words as well, however he quickly felt like he understood what she meant. Even if he, admittedly, also had never been truly hungry before. Which inadvertently led him to wonder, had Zisha D ever been hungry? Soon realising he wasn't going to get the additional information he was waiting for, Quafwem sauntered back to the desk, setting the sheet of paper down on it flatly with his blank side upwards, before pushing it over to Sheila slowly. You might have to interpret for your dear ambassador, he explained with wriggling ears, and Sheila showed basically no reaction as she moved to pick up the sheet. You see, I thought you might be interested in this, Quafwem already continued, not waiting for Sheila to read or relate any of the information contained on the paper to James, and he put his hands on the armrests of his chair in order to slowly lower himself back into the seat. I've recently been invited to serve as a repre- However, it was not in the car for him to finish his sentence, because at that moment, someone loudly began to bang against the door. Flinching at the interruption and freezing in the middle of his motion to sit down, Quafwem looked at the door annoyedly. His mouth opened to call something out to whoever was being a nuisance out there. However, that too was not granted to him as the door suddenly flew open without further input from him. Basically tumbling in through the frame came a mixed group, consisting of very out-of-breath Miet soldiers trying to recompose themselves with currently shocked expressions on their faces, and very concerned human soldiers with serious faces projected onto the visors of their masks, while they threw similarly annoyed glances to that of Quafram and the Miet. Immediately, Quafram yelled something out in a language that James did not comprehend, although he could very much guess that the man was asking his guards what was going on to warrant such an interruption. Meanwhile, James didn't even have to ask. A single look of his was enough for one of the soldiers to stand at attention. There appears to be unrest on the station, sir. The sergeant that was supposed to impersonate him a while ago reported without any digressions. Cause and perpetrators are unknown. However, it might prove to be a risk to your safety. We recommend immediate action. In the meantime... The Miet soldiers had also made their report to their respective boss, although still in an incomprehensible language. Looking for answers, James glanced over at Shida. They want to evacuate us, she immediately informed him, before nodding over at Quafom dismissively. Or, well, him. But I'm guessing we can tag along with that. James furrowed his brow while standing up from his seat without delay. Do they have any idea who's attacking? he asked, to which Shida quickly shook her head. As close as we are, she replied, while both human and Miet guards began to swarm around them in order to form a comprehensive formation that they could move in. But I told you the station was too full, 